Okay, uh, let's begin. So we have seen yesterday that an L theory is categorical or now what is called absolutely categorical if it has only one model up to isomorphism. Yeah, that was the original definition of Veblen. However, uh, thanks to Lohenheim's Kolem, his dreams were never to be realized. Yeah, uh, because if a theory has an infinite model, then it has, an, uh, has a model of every cardinality bigger equal the size of the language. Okay? Uh, every infinite cardinality bigger equal the size of language, thanks to Lohenheim's Coulomb theorem. So then we started looking at some weaker version of categoricity and which is the most appropriate one. So we say that an L theory is kappa categorical for a cardinal kappa bigger equal size of L, infinite cardinal, if any two models of gamma with size kappa are isomorphic. And we looked at some examples. So the theory of real vector spaces is indeed kappa categorical for every kappa bigger than the size of the field. Because every vector space of size kappa has a uh, kappa bigger than 2 to the aleph naught has a basis of the same size. And whenever two vector spaces have same size basis, then they are isomorphic. So therefore, this one works. Then obviously, gamma inf set, yeah, any, the theory of infinite sets in the empty language, L set. Yeah, that is kappa categorical for every infinite kappa. Obviously, because there is only one set up to isomorphism. And here, I mean, without loss, we are assuming axiom of choice. Yeah, otherwise this statement wouldn't be true. Because thanks to axiom of choice, every set has a cardinality. Every set is in bijection. It can be well ordered, so therefore you can find the least or, uh, ordinal with which it is in bijection. And therefore you, you can define the cardinality. Yeah, so well ordering theorem or equivalently axiom of choice is being assumed and we have been doing that since we started with like more advanced parts of logic anyway. Because uh, we proved compactness theorem, yeah, that is a consequence of axiom of choice, it uses prime filter theorem. Okay, then uh, yesterday we also showed an interesting result for dense linear orders that if your dense linear order is unbounded, then Cantor isomorphism theorem or which is also known as back and forth method, it shows you that this theory is aleph not categorical which means there is only one countable model up to isomorphism. Now just to add to this list, yeah, I am going to uh, say something more. Yeah, that is also a very interesting. Well, first let me define the language. So let us say this is the language of rings, yeah, which is F, G, H, C, E. That is what we have been using. Yeah, this is a binary, binary, unary, zero array, zero array. But I am going to interpret F and G as meet and join and H as complement and C and E as 0 and 1, the top uh, bottom and top element. So now I take the theory not of just Boolean algebras but atomless Boolean algebras. Okay, so atomless Boolean algebras, do you remember? Uh, do you remember any example of atomless Boolean algebras? Propositional, Propositional logic provides one example. Can you be more specific? Chain. chain. Chain is not an example of a Boolean algebra unless it is only two element chain. Say something more. Lindenbaum Tarski algebra, yes. For, for a countably infinite language, yes, that is definitely 
So, uh, LT algebra for a countably infinite propositional language. What was our uh, notation? We used BL, yeah. So BL, but size omega. Yeah, I mean size aleph naught. So this is an example. But in fact, this theory is aleph naught categorical. Okay. So what do I mean by that? That there is only one countably infinite model up to isomorphism. So there is. This is the only atomless Boolean algebra which is countably infinite and how do you prove something like that? If you remember yesterday we saw something about this Cantor isomorphism theorem. What was given to you? That uh, I mean even if let us say a DLO and bounded, yeah, there are two dense linear orders which are bounded and contain at least two, two elements. Yeah, so suppose that is given to you. Then you map the least element to least element, largest element to largest element and then in between you can play around just like this unbounded case. You can map any element to any element and then below that there is a non-minimal element, above that there is a non-maximal element and between any two elements there is a thanks to density. Now if you remember there was an exam question about density of atomless Boolean algebras. Right? So, atomless means that below any non-zero element, there is another non-zero element. So, that is like unbounded below. Okay? You will map 0 to 0, 1 to 1, but removing 0 and 1, it is unbounded below, it is unbounded above and it is also dense. So, using these properties, if you can list all the elements, of one Boolean algebra, one countably infinite atomless Boolean algebra and another countably infinite atomless Boolean algebra, then you can just follow the uh, back and forth method. You have to simply make sure that meets will get mapped to meets, joins will get mapped to joins. Yeah, there is slightly more work to do, but you can ultimately get there and therefore by a same argument, essentially the same argument, you can prove that this, this is the only countably infinite atomless Boolean algebra. So as soon as you have density and all, yeah, everything starts working fine. Density and unboundedness. Any questions? Yes, the idea is still the same. Another thing which might be interesting for you, yeah, so now I am going to talk about L ORT. Do you remember what it can consists of? One relation symbol which is binary, okay. And we saw that one of the examples is, uh, I mean the simplest possible example is directed graphs, but I can also talk about graphs they do not have to be directed. What is a graph? Do you remember the definition of a graph? What should you put in this theory? Simple graphs are, there are two properties, irreflexive and symmetric. Very good. So, a simple graph. So, I am going to take theory of simple graphs. Okay, so this is irreflexive plus symmetric binary relation. So this is the uh, definition, but I am going to add something more to it. Okay, uh, so for every single graph, so for example, I am giving you this, okay, just this collection. This, this is a graph, this is a simple graph. 
how many vertices does it have? 3. Okay. Now, can you write down a sentence which says that a subgraph of my graph is isomorphic to this. The induced subgraph is isomorphic to this. Induced subgraph is isomorphic. What does that mean? I have some graph and it has three vertices. If I restrict to only those three vertices, then the graph will look exactly like this. So, what should I write down? There exists W1, W2, W3. Such that R, W1, W2. Very good. R, W2, W3 and and not R, W1, W3. Do you understand this? What, what does this say? This says that there is, yeah, let me call this G equal to VE, yeah, vertex and edge set. So, this sentence says that, uh, let me call this phi G, yeah. So, phi G says that there is, like G is an induced subgraph. G is isomorphic to, maybe I, I, I should be precise, is isomorphic to an induced subgraph. Okay, so every single finite graph can be written like this. Definitely, every single finite graph will have a corresponding sentence phi g. So, what if I say random simple graph? This consists of, yeah, I mean gamma simple graph union phi g such that G is a finite simple graph. So, what am I claiming? I am claiming that there is, I mean first of all I am claiming that this theory is satisfiable. Okay, first try to understand what it is saying. This is satisfiable means that there is a graph which has one copy of a given finite simple graph as an induced subgraph and this should happen for any finite simple graph. So, obviously you can imagine this structure if it is satisfiable then it must have an infinite model. Correct? Because the, the size of this finite graphs can grow larger and larger and larger. So, therefore, if it is satisfiable then it must be infinite. Now, how do you show this is satisfiable? Compactness. Yeah, you choose so the theory of simple graphs that much you should always retain it is just two sentences and then you should add phi g for finitely many of them. Well, do you know any, any such example? If there are only finitely many such graphs, then you take disjoint union of all such and then that is a model of that finite subset. So, therefore, this is finitely satisfiable. So, by compactness this is satisfiable and by Leeuwenheim's Coulomb theorem, it must have a countable model. Because the language is singleton. So, the smallest infinite cardinal bigger equal size of language is Aleph naught. Okay, so, I said lot of things. <laughs> yeah, uh, so, this must have an infinite model of size Aleph naught. Okay.
So thanks to compactness, we know this exists. So this one is called a random graph. Yeah. Uh, why is it called a random graph? So basically, you start with a countably infinite set of vertices. Yeah, let me uh, draw some picture for you. And then, so random graph. You start with countably infinite set of vertices, and between any two vertices, if you want to put, uh, whether you want to uh, add an edge or not, you decide that by doing a coin toss. Okay? If it is heads, I will put an edge. If it is tails, if it is a fair coin, yeah, then what, however I construct this graph and you have to do it for every single pair. So that's why it's called a random graph. And how many such random graphs are there? Countable, countably infinite random graphs. Well, I'm writing it as, an, as, a, as the fifth example. So you can guess there is only one up to isomorphism. OK? So this depends on coin toss. You have a question? Okay, so uh, there is only one such random graph and how do you prove that there is only one such random graph? The idea is very simple. Back and forth method. There is no other argument that you know. Okay, so you start by mapping any vertex to any other vertex. Then you look at it's uh, now you choose another vertex and uh, now you look at the subgraph generated by those two yeah now that subgraph is finite so you must be able to find by appropriate choice of capital g you must be able to find such induced subgraph in this model and then you keep on building and building and you will get an isomorphism using back and forth method. You have to be a little bit more careful, but back and forth method works. Okay, let's not go into details. So I'm giving you all sorts of examples uh, of how logic can be helpful in ordinary mathematics, pure mathematics. Yeah, we have seen one example of uh, hyperreals, which is analysis. Yeah, this is graph theory. This is Boolean algebras. We, are, uh, we have been talking about algebraically closed fields. So algebra is there. Yeah, everything can be done appropriate, with appropriate choice of languages and theories. Okay, so yes, one more thing I think we also wrote, did we write this gamma SEF0 is kappa categorical for kappa bigger than aleph naught. Well, actually, uh, if you observe all these examples, yeah, then if you cross a certain threshold, then we are saying it's kappa categorical for all kappa bigger than a certain threshold. Is that a coincidence? The behavior is very different for Aleph naught or in this case real numbers, the cardinality of real numbers, the behavior is different. I mean how many uh, vector spaces are there up to isomorphism of cardinality same as real numbers? R, R square, R cube, so for each non-zero uh, natural number as dimension, you have a different one. 
right? So the behavior was different for the cardinality of real numbers. But if you cross that, then the behavior is identical. Similarly here, yeah, the behavior is, uh, yes, here, atomless Boolean algebras, it is Aleph not categorical, but it is not categorical for uncountable cardinals. Similarly, this is Aleph not categorical, but it is not uncountably categorical. Yeah, for example, real numbers, real numbers are a model of this, right? Real numbers are dense, rational numbers are dense, right? So, uh, you can actually play around with, with things, okay, but perhaps I should not say more, uh, if you remember Dedekind cuts, yeah, then uh, using Dedekind cuts, you can say certain things over here because Dedekind cuts, uh, I mean, they are, they materialize, they realize in real numbers, but they don't realize in rational numbers. Yeah, because in rational numbers, there are gaps. In real numbers, there are no gaps. So, that way, the behavior of reals and rationals is different. They are not in the same cardinality. They are not in same cardinality, but I am trying to provide you with one model of real num uh, with of this theory, which is not isomorphic to real numbers. So what you do? You take real numbers plus a single vertex, single point plus a copy of rational numbers. Okay, that is a model of this, but it is not isomorphic to real numbers. It has the same size, but it is not isomorphic. Okay, that is because of Dedekind cuts. So, uh, my main point is that there is a very fixed cardinality, which is the size of language plus Aleph naught this cardinality and then all higher cardinals. So, there is a clear distinction in behavior of this and that is not a surprise when people observe this, then uh, one very prominent model theorist, logician, he proved this result. So, that is called and its proof is very hard. Morley Categoricity Theorem. So, suppose kappa is bigger than size of L plus Aleph naught. If gamma is an L theory, that is kappa categorical, then gamma is lambda categorical for each lambda bigger than size of L plus Aleph naught. So, the behavior is only different for this particular cardinal number size of L plus Aleph naught. And if it is ca categorical for some kappa, then it is categorical for all kappa satisfying this cardinality condition. Yeah, this is a very deep theorem in model theory. Yeah, and all the examples that we have seen definitely uh, Make, make this belief strong. Yeah? For example, this. I gave you some examples yesterday of countable models of this. Yeah? Q algebar, then Q algebar x, x1, x2, xn. You add uh, some finite transcendence degree. Yeah? And then uh, there are different non isomorphic, pairwise non isomorphic models. Any questions about this? Okay, 
Now, uh, perhaps we should come back to a simpler question. So, we have shown that if a theory has model which is finite, then if a complete theory has a finite model, then every model of that theory is has the same size. Okay, but uh, I think we also mentioned something about the converse, a test for completeness. You remember that? It's called Wash Watt test. So let us quickly state and prove this. If gamma is an L theory without any finite model, and gamma is kappa categorical for some kappa bigger equal aleph naught plus size of L, then, uh, then gamma is complete. What is our favorite method of proof in logic? Induction, yes, but the second, <laughs> second most favorite. Induction cannot be used here. What will you in induct on? Proof by contradiction. So we are going to do that. So suppose not. Suppose gamma is incomplete. Okay, so incomplete theory. Yeah, that's a prelude to tomorrow's lecture. Gödel's incompleteness theorems. Yeah, it's about incomplete theories. So suppose gamma is incomplete, then what can you say? It is incomplete, so it cannot decide about some sentence. Yeah, so then there is some phi such that gamma does not logically imply phi and gamma does not logically imply negation phi. Okay. So, by there was an exercise which we have done several times like uh, so then what can you say about this? Both of them are satisfiable. So let M1 be a model of gamma union negation infinity uh, negation phi and M2 be a model of gamma union phi. So since gamma does not have a finite model, M1 and M2 are infinite. Now, using a combination of both Leeuwenheim's Coulomb theorems, uh, using LS theorems. There is a model N1 of theory of M1 such that size of N1 is equal to kappa. Theory of M1, N, M1 is a satisfiable collection of sentences, right? So, uh, 
therefore we can get some some n1 of size kappa because you can go up and down yeah upward and Leu downward levinheim skolem theorems they will guarantee existence of this okay and similarly n2 satisfying theory of m2 such that size of n2 is equal to kappa now observe i am talking about theory of m1 which is the collection of sentences which are true in m1 so gamma is contained inside there yeah so in particular n1 satisfies gamma and it also satisfies negation phi and n2 satisfies gamma and it satisfies phi so n1 and n2 are both models of gamma but one satisfies phi and another one satisfies negation phi so can they be isomorphic therefore n1 and n2 are models of gamma that are not isomorphic uh, models of gamma with size kappa and therefore what we have shown therefore gamma is not kappa categorical end of proof we simply proved the contra positive and this is wash what test very simple proof so using this now you can conclude lots of things yeah let me go back to this slide where we have we are looking at examples of uh, categorical theories so let us look at this the theory of infinite vector spaces yeah i mean this is important i am not saying zero is a real vector space i don't want that i want to say add an axiom which says that there exists a w such that w is not equal to zero if i add that then this theory is kappa categorical for any kappa so it is it satisfies the hypothesis of wash what test look at this it should be an l theory without any finite model so i said that there is at least one non zero element and as soon as there is one non zero element i should have all its scalar multiples so it becomes infinite so therefore the theory of vec uh, vector spaces without non zero vector spaces or infinite vector spaces that theory is kappa categorical and hence complete similarly the theory of dense linear orders which are unbounded that is alef not categorical can it have a finite model no so therefore it is also a complete theory what if i talk about bounded dense linear orders then i should add the hypothesis that there are at least two elements because by density by two elements i can generate infinitely many of them so the theory of bounded dense linear orders with at least two elements is also alef not categorical and hence complete right uh, theory of atomless boolean algebras of course every atomless boolean algebra has to be infinite yeah so the theory of atomless boolean algebras is also complete similarly theory of random graphs is complete and acf0 is also complete similarly acf p is also complete for any prime p if you understand what is characteristic of a ring so there are so many examples of complete theories but yeah i mean let me uh, quickly say something 
that for finite things it doesn't really work. One theory can have one finite model and another finite model of the same size but they are not isomorphic. So for example, Z mod 2Z we have seen this, then you can take its product with Z mod 2Z and Z mod 4Z is another group, both of them contain four elements but they are not isomorphic. Okay, you consider 1 in Z mod 4Z, then you, how many times do you need to add 1 to itself to get 0? 4 times, 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 4, 4 is 0 modulo 4Z, so therefore there is one element of order 4 in that side, but every element on this side has order 2. Okay? So therefore, yeah, I mean it's pairs of 1 and zeros. 1 comma 1 is of order 2 because 1, 1 comma 1 plus 1 comma 1 is 2 comma 2 which is 0 comma 0. This is called Klein fear group. Fear is 4 in German. Yeah, Klein was German so he said it's Klein fear group. I mean, he did not name it Klein Fear Group, <laughs> but okay. So there can be a theory which has a finite two non-isomorphic finite models of same cardinality. Okay. All right. So now let us go ahead. I think uh, I have said everything I wanted to say about this. Okay, now we want to understand this. Let us go back to high school. Around 8th grade, you must have first heard of the term quadratic equation. 7th, 8th, yeah, I am older than you, so I don't know when you learnt it. So, how do you solve a quadratic equation? Huh? Which one? Completing the square, yes, fine. But I am going to ask you this, suppose A, B and C are fixed uh, coefficients. So if I write A w square plus B w plus C equal to 0 and then I am asking you whether there is a real number because you only knew at that time you only knew real numbers. Yeah? <laughs> so whether there is a real number which satisfies this, just the question whether there is one, I am not asking you to find it. Can you do it in terms of A, B and C? Yes. What is the answer? B square minus 4AC is bigger equal 0. Okay, so this is true if and only if b square minus 4ac is bigger or equal 0. So if I am talking about the ordered field of real numbers, then look at that side of the formula. Does it contain any quantifiers? No. So that is a quantifier free formula which is logically equivalent to this modulo theory of real numbers. Okay, I mean this modulo theory of real numbers needs a little bit more explanation. 
So I can write it for you. See, the, it says that theory of real numbers witnesses that for all W A, W B, W C, there exists a W such that A W S square plus B W B plus W C equal to 0 if and only if W B square minus 4 W A W C is bigger equal 0. So basically the theory of real numbers witnesses that these two sent, uh, these two formulas are the same. So what we have said that one formula with quantifiers, this one is logically equivalent modulo the theory to a quantifier free formula. So if you can do it, so uh, now let me write down the more technical term. So say that an L theory gamma eliminates quantifiers if for any formula phi x bar there exists a quantifier free formula psi x bar such that gamma witnesses that for all w bar phi w bar and psi w bar are logically equivalent. W A what? Oh, sorry. Yes, I may made a mistake here. Thank you. Let me write it again. W A W square plus W B W plus W C equal to zero. Yeah. So a theory is said to eliminate quantifiers if for any formula there is a quantifier form free formula which is logically equivalent to it. Okay. Now this is the process that I mean in general there is no recipe for this. Yeah, for eliminating quantifiers there is no recipe. There are some well practiced techniques, but they work only in special situations. But before we do this, let me remind you that every formula is logically equivalent to one in a particular form. What is that form called? The prenex normal form. So prenex normal form has all the quantifiers in the beginning. So uh, this is simply a reminder that all quantifiers yeah, Q uh, W1 bar, Q W2 bar, I mean Q1 W1 bar, Q2 W2 bar and so on, Q K W K bar and then inside it is quantifier free. Now, if I want to eliminate the quantifiers, then I should first look at only this. just the last quantifier which is present there. And then uh, if I can eliminate that, then I will go to a larger q k minus 1. Then I will eliminate that, then I will eliminate all from, so we open it up from the inside and then we get to outside. Is that clear? 
yeah, we try to eliminate quantifiers from inside out. And what is the quantifier that we have chosen in our language? We always choose there exist and not for all because for all is negation there exists negation. So even if you can eliminate, yeah, just there exist is it's okay. Moreover, okay, now a quantifier free formula in what format can we write that? A quantifier free formula you remember from propositional logic what is the normal form for that? DNF, yeah, so the DNF also works here. Okay, so DNF always looks like this. Disjunction of conjunctions and if there is a there exist outside, then actually if you remember we proved a logical equivalence that I can take it inside. This is logically equivalent to this. If you don't remember this, do it as an exercise. That disjunction and there exist, you can swap. Okay. So therefore, now the whole process of qu eliminating quantifiers simply boils down to eliminating quantifiers from a conjunction of atomic formulas. Conjunction of literals. So in this case, literals are either atomic formulas or their negations. Okay, so eliminating quantifier simply boils down to eliminating a quantifier from a conjunction of literals, finite conjunction of literals. Okay, first let us try to understand what this quantifier really means. So, for example, yeah, I am writing down this particular equation which you all know, x square plus y square equal to 1. In real numbers, what is the definable set of this? It's a circle, yeah. You are all scared to say the circle now, <laughs> yeah? but this is actually a formula and I am asking you what is the def set defined by this. So uh, fine, this is a circle, I am going to draw a circle. What is the origin? 0, 0 and this point is 1, 0, okay good. Now I am asking if I project onto the first component which means I should write this. There exists a w such that x square plus w square is equal to 1. What are the values of x which satisfy this? What are the values of real numbers which satisfy this? Minus 1 it does satisfy 0, 1, everything in between, everything in between. So this is satisfied, yeah, so uh, the set defined by is the interval minus 1 to 1. Okay, so basically what I am doing I am looking at a point, then I am drawing the vertical line at that point and I am asking whether this vertical line intersects the circle. If I draw a vertical line over here, does it intersect the circle? No. So therefore, that point is not in minus 1, 1, the closed interval. I mean, the formula here is simple, right? It is minus 1 less equal x less equal 1. This is a formula, yeah, minus 1 is less equal x and x is less equal 1. 
so that's the formula so what is the meaning what is the geometric interpretation of their exist its projection so geometric interpretation of their exist is projection so if you are given a definable set then you try to project it down to something smaller you are studying linear algebra yeah so in linear algebra you solve solution uh, solve systems of linear equations now those linear equations are finite conjunctions of atomic formulas yeah because what are atomic formulas in the case of real vector spaces the language of real vector spaces some scalar combi scalar multiples of some variables is equal to scalar multiples of constants so ultimately you can rewrite it as a single linear equation r linear equation right so that one you can project and then you ask whether this particular system of linear equations has a solution what are you doing you are asking for there exist a w such that some system some matrix equation yeah a bar uh then usually you write w bar y bar and you are asking for w bar and is equal to some b bar this is what you are asking gaussian elimination method will let you solve this system of equations well actually if you work a little bit harder you can show that that gamma r vector spaces eliminates quantifiers i mean essentially uh, the argument is based on gaussian elimination so you are asking for projections of solution sets of linear uh, systems to lower dimensions and that projection is there exist if you want a geometric interpretation of for all quantifier universal quantifier then this vertical line has to lie entirely inside the definable set see there exist says that the vertical green line there is a point on the green line which is also on the definable set for all says for all points on the green vertical line it is inside the definable set so there is lot of geometry hidden in these pictures i will uh, end this by giving you more uh, so this is uh, usually called qe yeah quantifier elimination qe is quantifier elimination so uh, some more examples of theories which admit quantifier elimination so that is gamma scf yeah the theory of algebraically closed fields it eliminates quantifiers in algebraic geometry this is a celebrated theorem it's called chevalier's theorem i mean in more technical terms it says that the projection of any algebraic variety is a constructible set constructible set is a finite boolean combination of algebraic varieties and algebraic varieties are solution sets of polynomial equations so this is the one then gamma rcf okay real closed fields which means the theory of real numbers as an ordered field okay uh, so this is called tarski seidenberg theorem yeah there are big names associated with this 
Then similarly, you can show that uh, theory of dense linear orders also eliminates quantifiers. Then theory of ordered abelian groups also eliminates quantifiers. Pressburger arithmetic, which is a weaker form of our normal arithmetic on natural numbers, that also eliminates quantifiers. And it has applications in computer science because you want to eliminate quantifiers fast enough. Yeah, so computer scientists are very heavy on this because decidability problems and algorithms, they all depend on how fast you can eliminate quantifiers. Okay. So, yeah, with this I am going to end today's lecture.